Um, I, yes, good day. Um, my name, uh, welcome to the International Association for the Study of the Commons, or IASC's fourth annual World Commons Week event. And thank you for attending. My name is Charlie Schweik. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the USA. And I'm the president elect of the IASC and a co-organizer of the World Commons Week 22 event, uh, which launched yesterday. This is our first webinar. Uh, World Commons Week is a global annual event celebrating pr and promoting commons research and practice. And this is the keynote webinar for the IASC Africa region. I'd like to welcome my IASC colleague, Dr. Evaristo Map Edza, who serves in the role of ISC's regional coordinator for the African continent and who organized this webinar. So let me just explain how it'll work. We've asked our distinguished speaker to talk for about 30, 35 minutes. I'll act as a timer and will signal when he has five minutes left. The last 10 minutes of the session will be left for question and answers. Everesto will moderate. Um, if you notice, attendees, there's a Q&A function on the, on the Zoom um, menu. To ensure the webinars function well, we've limited video to the speaker and the moderator and, and the audio for attendees is muted. Um, audio, as I said, audience members can use the Q&A function. We'll read your questions and our speaker can respond to them. If it appears uh, we need to have a dialogue between you and the speaker, I'll unmute you. Um, for any attendees who have called in by phone, you can uh, ask a question by dialing star nine to toggle raise the lower hand function. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn now to, uh, yeah, James, or, or to Everesto to uh, uh, introduce James. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Charlie, and welcome uh, to Dr. James Mrombezi and, uh, some of you already in this panel, or in this uh, webinar, might already know uh, Dr. Mrombezi. Uh, Dr. Mrombezi uh, is with uh, the UN uh, Economic Commission for Africa and uh, within the Africa Climate Policy Center office, uh, where is the officer in charge. And in the interest of time, since we have uh, lost a bit of time, I will not go into the other details, but uh, just to mention that uh, Dr. Mrombezi has a lot of experience across the different countries, a number of uh, countries and regions uh, within uh, Africa. Uh, so we hope to get a lot of uh, uh, good insights from him where he's presenting on one of his paper, which is under review and will be published, most likely be going to be published very soon. So Dr. Mrombezi, I will not go into uh, much details uh, and over to you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mapeza. Uh, thank you, uh, Charlie. Um, and uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, participants, depending on where you are. So uh, yes, yeah, I would, I, would, I would like to sort of talk to this uh, topic of uh, the, the, the challenges in global climate governance, which emanate from the uh, differences in interests, uh, the differences in motivation, uh, and the differences in the political pressures that uh, states, uh, states experience from their own uh, direct constituencies, the citizens, uh, but also from uh, the global constituency. Uh, and these are uh, challenges that are created by the fact that uh, the state as a Westphalian construct is sovereignty over geographic uh, territory. But the climate challenge is in fact a challenge of uh, a global atmospheric uh, commons. Uh, and of course, uh, to resolve this uh, challenge, as we know, uh, the uh, the collection of our states uh, under the, um, the, the the umbrella of the United Nations they have come together to create the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. This is one of the three uh, so-called uh, um, Rio conventions, Rio treaties, the other two being the United Nations Convention on biodiversity and the convention on um, uh, desertification. 
the other two are conventions uh, with the agreed rules of procedures, uh, with uh, agreed uh, mechanisms for compelling uh, parties to the conventions to act and with very specific details on how uh, actions under those uh, conventions would be aggregated towards the global goals of either managing, uh, conserving biodiversity, managing the use of biodiversity or uh, controlling uh, desertification. But the Climate Change Convention uh, is in fact a framework convention, which means that it is not binding in the same way as the other two Rio conventions. And the reasons for that are multiple, but I think are clearly understood. Uh, they lie in uh, firstly uh, the, the contestations uh, in the understanding of the nature of the climate, cl climate um, crisis itself, um, uh, but also in the implications of uh, climate action on uh, national uh, economies. Uh, and of course, the subsequent political implications. Um, so what we have uh, then the UNFCCC is a convention, a framework convention, but it has uh, been uh, succeeded in putting together two treaties uh, in order to, to at least uh, start uh, some uh, climate actions at the national uh, scale. Uh, although, in fact, as we know, most climate action actually does happen at the subnational uh, level than at the national level, and we'll discuss that uh, later. Uh, the, the, the second uh, issue that we have to uh, think, keep in mind as we discuss the challenges of climate action or global climate governance and its implications for climate action at the national is the role of non-parties to the uh, convention. The convention is an agreement between party members who, by definition, are states represented by uh, governments, of course. But within states, you also have multiple actors who in the terms in the terminology of the uh, of the UNFCCC are referred to as uh, non-state actors we have tremendous influence on what happens or what decisions are taken by states and therefore all those decisions are reflected at global level uh, but who are also becoming increasingly significant actors at the global level itself even if they are not parties to the UNFCCC but this is all part of the uh, Westphalian uh, uh, challenge. So going to the uh, uh, background, uh, we are aware that uh, the, the whole uh, climate uh, challenge is in fact a challenge of the dumping of waste products from the burning of fossil fuels, which accelerated uh, uh, at the advent of the Industrial uh, Revolution, uh, with the advent of uh, the uh, use of uh, firstly steam, uh, and then of course it evolves into more complex uh, energies and uh, forms of uh, converting uh, fossil fuels uh, into uh, energy. Uh, so uh, the, the whole industrial revolution therefore is uh, the basis on which the climate, the, the, the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere begins to accelerate beyond uh, what would have happened or what would have occurred through natural releases of uh, greenhouse uh, gases. And so in fact, uh, the increase has been uh, more than, uh, the, the increase has actually been uh, quite significant uh, in terms of the rate, but also in terms of the quantity of um, the greenhouse gases being uh, emitted into the atmosphere. Uh, now, we also need to understand that uh, the Industrial Revolution is in fact a revolution that occurred in a small number of states. It was not evenly distributed uh, globally uh, for a variety uh, of uh, uh, reasons, uh, most of them uh, relating to the laws of uneven uh, development, but also subsequently linked to the power relations between uh, different uh, states. So in fact, you could actually map uh, the countries uh, uh, or the economies uh, that uh, developed rapidly as a result of the greenhouse gas, um, as, as a result of the, the, the industrial revolution and also increased their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, also those nations which by the time of the industrial revolution already had enormous control over the distribution of raw materials, the use of raw materials, the distribution of profits uh, globally. In other words, they were already advanced economies. 
uh, and uh, the, the the increase in their gross domestic product. If you allow, if you accept uh, GDP as a measure for economic development, you can actually link very clearly the increase in uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, to uh, GDP. So uh, burning fossil fuels is actually a driver of economic development at the same time that it is a driver of uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the uh, atmosphere. Uh, but because economies are growing on a national scale, they are national economies, they are not global economies, they are dumping uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, into uh, the uh, uh, global atmosphere, the global atmospheric commons. And so as climate change increasingly became evident, it also became necessary to develop forms of cooperation that would ensure that nations could come together to regulate uh, their emissions of uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, and this was part of the process uh, leading to the establishment of the leading to the Rio Earth Conference back in 92. But in fact, uh, the uh, global uh, observations of changes in the atmosphere, it uh, began way back in the 1930s, 1940s, when it became clear that uh, the uh, carbon dioxide, particularly in the atmosphere, would stay in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, and that it would continue to impact the climate system, and that if nothing was done to reduce and the, the, the emissions and if the concentrations continued, the impacts of those concentrations would actually become more and more uh, severe. So this led to uh, that whole process resulting in the uh, establishment of a global governance uh, regime. But that process was uh, complicated by the fact that uh, nation states continued to be interested in maintaining the growth or the potential uh, of their economies uh, for growth uh, because their sovereignty is in fact determined by what they do on their own geographic territory while what happens in the atmosphere is a collective responsibility or is no one's responsibility until you have put in place a mechanism for a collective uh, decision uh, making. Uh, and so uh, as a result, uh, I think uh, it, 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 it is now uh, generally agreed that uh, the, the establishment of a global governance regime is uh, a massive uh, challenge for collective action regarding the atmosphere. And it has been defined or uh, identified in very different ways by uh, different um, analysts, observers, commentators, depending on the focus of those uh, observations. So some have seen it as uh, a regime complex. Uh, others uh, as, as a, a complicated uh, situation of transnational uh, governance, uh, while others see it as a problem of polycentric governance where different levels uh, and different uh, governance structures come together to develop a mutually comprehensible governance uh, regime. Uh, in, in, in all of that, uh, there are many different uh, forms uh, of global action. This is recognized states can either compete uh, or they can act unilaterally, or they can take no action, or they can collaborate in order to regulate any uh, global uh, commons. Uh, in the case of uh, the climate, I think we've actually seen uh, aspects of all forms uh, of choices uh, taken by, uh, the, by, by, by different countries at different uh, times. So, the original establishment of the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change was itself an act of collaboration between states at Rio uh, in uh, 92. But that collaboration was never complete because as soon as the uh, convention started to define uh, responsibilities and to allocate uh, responsibilities, rights, and uh, uh, costs to uh, the different uh, state players, you begin to have differences among nations. The first success in collaboration was the Kyoto Protocol, but even that was incomplete because the Kyoto Protocol was based on allocating responsibilities between developed nations and developing countries. 
uh, so-called the Annex One countries being the developed nations, we had uh, responsibilities to uh, firstly limit their greenhouse gas emissions within a specified time frame, and to also support climate actions to adapt to the impacts of climate uh, change in developing countries. That is, developed countries had responsibilities to mitigate, but they also had the um, responsibility to support adaptation in developing countries. Developing countries, on the other hand, have the responsibility to design, to design and implement actions to ensure adaptation to the changing uh, climate system, while at the same time maintaining uh, the prospects or the, 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 the possibilities of uh, developing their economies in today's balance, the possibilities of meeting their sustainable development uh, uh, goals. So in the, from the very outset, uh, the Kyoto Protocol was problematic in the sense that some developed countries, particularly the US, never in fact ratified the Kyoto Protocol. They, they ratified the UNFCCC convention, but never in fact ratified the Kyoto Protocol. In other words, they refused to be bound by the restrictive measures of the pure Kyoto Protocol in terms of the implications uh, on, um, uh, on, on, on their economies. Uh, we all know that the US subsequently became a party to the Paris Agreement and then withdrew from the Paris Agreement. Uh, and it is, I think, instructive to note that when the US withdrew from the Paris Agreement, the president, the US president at the time actually said the country was consciously choosing Pittsburgh over Paris. Pittsburgh being the industrial uh, steel producing uh, region. Uh, of course, therefore, uh, a high uh, greenhouse gas emitting uh, region. In, in effectively, what the president is saying is, well, the US chooses the growth of the national economy driven by fossil fuels over the Paris Agreement, which would limit the ability of the nation to uh, burn fossil uh, fuels. Uh, the same kind of set sentiment is expressed by other nations who did not become party to the Kyoto Protocol or withdrew from the pure Kyoto Protocol, uh, Canada, Russia, uh, in the sense that they also cited the potential economic costs of remaining in those agreements as the basis for their decision making. So, but the UNFCCC is based firstly on collaboration, and then, of course, those collaboration actions very quickly run into problems. But there's also uh, characteristics of uh, competition, where countries are determined to ensure that they maintain their economic competitive advantage uh, over others, which is, of course, uh, li linked to uh, the whole distribution of uh, power, political, economic, uh, military power uh, globally. Some nations have actually taken unilateral action, and this is becoming very evident now as, as, as countries make commitments to uh, uh, achieving a net, net zero in terms of uh, the Paris Agreement, while other countries have taken uh, no action at all. But this is to note that all of these four forms of uh, uh, action uh, at the global level are in fact indicative of the different types of outcomes that are possible uh, when you have this, mis, uh, the, the, this mismatch between levels uh, of um, sovereignty, levels of authority, and levels of uh, competence, but also where you have potential uh, mismatch between the intentions uh, of different uh, countries regarding the outcomes at their national level and the uh, global uh, outcomes. Now, the common assumption is uh, that uh, states are more likely to open for international cooperation uh, where this actually addresses issues around global uh, public goods than local or national goods. Uh, and where there is the, 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 the global action concerns uh, local or national goods, there's very little incentive uh, for uh, states to collaborate, to cooperate, uh, because in fact, uh, national uh, self-interest is driven uh, by competition rather than by uh, um, collaboration. Uh, so in this case, then uh, climate change, uh, climate actions at the global level are always more likely to be successful where the outcomes are in fact uh, viewed uh, as uh, global public goods. Uh, 
where they do not infect, the outcomes do not elicit any types of uh, uh, rivalries uh, or limits on national uh, benefits. Uh, and an example is a way uh, mitigating climate change can actually be seen as a public good that is generally distributed to all of the uh, nations. For instance, if the impacts of climate change begin to be felt equally by all nations, then it, the likelihood is that all nations are going to begin to cooperate and collaborate in establishing a functioning uh, climate governance regime. You know, when I say, for instance, feeling the impacts of climate change equally, uh, one could argue that uh, well, countries have got different capacities to uh, manage those impacts depending on the levels of their economies. But then you have impacts such as, for instance, um, if you can adapt, let's say, to uh, a drying uh, weather uh, system, uh, these other countries that cannot adapt to that are likely to, for instance, uh, look to uh, those countries that are adapting better to support their own adaptation actions. In other words, they are likely to increase, to, to look at mechanisms that would increase the cost, the adaptation costs of those countries that already can bear the cost. And there are many formal or informal mechanisms uh, by which this can happen and has been uh, happening. And so part of the global governance regime has actually been uh, aimed towards ensuring that climate action, particularly mit mitigation action, is seen as and reported as uh, a, a global uh, public good. So mitigation in one economy can in fact have uh, uh, comparable positive impacts in another economy. And this is very clearly developing now in terms of the, uh, under the Paris Agreement. We'll discuss that a little bit uh, 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 more. So the structural uh, determinant, or one of the key structural determinants for international control, co cooperation is the level of joint gains uh, that are, or, or at least the perception of the level of uh, joint gains. Now this requires very complex institutional arrangements, including reporting, monitoring, transparency, and so on, to see, uh, firstly, to monitor what the, jo what the gains of any uh, climate action uh, at the national and the global level, but also to monitor progress and uh, also to monitor compliance uh, with the whatever mechanisms are put uh, in place. The level of complexity uh, is, is such that, uh, in fact, the amount of investment that is required in establishing and maintaining a global climate governance regime is, is quite massive. Um, now, uh, the choice is, uh, as we say, even where, you, where states have reached an international agreement, uh, the nature of choices that states make and the level of commitment to cooperation uh, that states make also are very uh, varied. And one of the easiest ways to see the level of commitment that individual states are making to climate action is the extent to which they are domesticating global agreements in their own national policies and uh, legislations, right? So countries, for instance, can choose to put in place uh, policies that would regulate uh, the emissions of greenhouse gas emissions from normal economic processes within their own economies, like carbon taxes, like incentives uh, to limit uh, the amount of carbon that is produced um, uh, in, 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 in uh, economic production, in consumption, in distribution uh, processes. Uh, they can also uh, put in place uh, negative uh, incentives, uh, such as, for instance, um, uh, uh, countries, uh, and this is uh, continuing, countries can subsidize the use of um, fossil fuels in order to maintain certain processes, certain trajectories in their own economies. Now, that is very negative in the sense that the global regime is looking to moving away from fossil fuels and therefore subsidies are going to. So you have a variety of mechanisms, uh, but the, 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 the point here is that the extent to which countries domesticate, internalize uh, their, the agreements that they make at global level is typically represented in actions, in policy and legislative actions. So states can opt for hard laws. That is, they can actually opt to be part of a legally binding international uh, treaty, or they can opt to be part of uh, a, a soft laws, uh, such as a set of norms or recommendations or guidelines uh, at the global uh, uh, level. 
One could say that the uh, Kyoto Protocol was a hard law to the extent that uh, it sought to uh, actually be a binding treaty, but also to the extent that it sought to allocate rights and responsibilities among states to regulate uh, the, their, to, to mitigate uh, the greenhouse gas emissions of their economies, and also uh, to support adaptation actions in different uh, other countries. Uh, the successor to the uh, Paris Agreement, and the reason, I mean, the successor to the Kyoto Protocol, sorry, the reason why the Kyoto Protocol collapsed was in fact the perception among developed countries that the protocol was working to limit their development potential through fossil fuel based energy, while their competitors, emerging economies, particularly China, Russia, uh, to some extent, Brazil, India, were in fact allowed by the Kyoto Protocol to continue burning fossil fuels and therefore to actually develop or advance their economies at a faster rate in an era where alternative fuels have not become fully available or had not been fully uh, deployed. So the, the collapse of the uh, Kyoto Protocol then uh, results in the Paris Agreement. Uh, the Paris Agreement moves away completely from the Kyoto Protocol and allocates responsibilities to all nations, regardless of their development status. But critically also, uh, the Paris Agreement allows countries to determine their own contributions to climate action and puts in place very weak mechanisms to hold countries accountable for those nationally determined uh, commitments. In other words, the Paris Agreement is a very soft form of law, which is completely voluntary, and its implementation is based on the uh, willingness of uh, the state to uh, put in place mechanisms that would contribute towards the uh, uh, global goal. Um, so that is the uh, legalization uh, dimension. And we can actually look at what has actually happened in terms of uh, the different uh, uh, levels of uh, legalizations in the different countries. But the point is to demonstrate that in fact, uh, in very few countries do actually have a level of legalization where countries unambiguously define climate actions, which are not in fact decided on the basis of their implications on their economic growth and other development uh, potential. Now, what are the determinants of uh, these uh, choices that have been made by the different uh, states? We've already hinted that um, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions has a very enormous uh, cost on uh, national economies. Uh, in terms of uh, new investments in new forms of energy, uh, in terms of uh, jobs, uh, in terms of uh, the cost of uh, uh, moving uh, goods and services in different ways, and so on. Uh, but as the costs and benefit ratios have actually improved, as we have seen more investments in renewable in energy, for instance, or more investments in production, in, in more energy efficient uh, uh, production technologies, we've also seen a, a, an increasing willingness among states to invest in climate action. So even those advanced economies that would have been opposed to, uh, for instance, some of the provisions of the Kyoto Protocol, have actually started to internalize some of the more, uh, should we say, uh, uh, radical provisions of the climate, of, of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement, uh, because in fact the cost of implementing those actions are now it's, it's easier for those economies to actually uh, uh, internalize the cost of implementing climate actions than it would have been uh, before those technologies had been developed. Again, therefore, we can conclude that uh, the, the, the Westphalian state can only support global climate actions when the costs of those global climate actions can be absorbed by the Westphalian state. If those costs cannot be absorbed in efficient ways by the national economies, then the likelihood is that the state will not collaborate uh, or will not cooperate at a global level or will, will co cooperate in a limited way uh, in the global governance of the climate system. The Paris Agreement, as I have said, is uh, a voluntary uh, agreement. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the fact that uh, countries are making their own commitments based on their own national contributions and circumstances uh, 
uh, means that in fact the pa Paris Agreement has from day one struggled to ensure that the aggregated total of national climate actions in fact uh, meets the actual objective of the global agreement. Now this is to say that uh, the Paris Agreement intends uh, to firstly ensure that the uh, global climate increase can be limited to 1.5 degrees uh, and the mechanism that is used to limit uh, that uh, increase is the nationally determined contributions where each country puts in place mechanisms to regulate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, in order to uh, meet uh, the 1.5 degrees, uh, the Paris Agreement has also put in place a mechanism uh, for reporting uh, on the impact of all of the nationally determined contributions of all of the countries. As of 2022, all of the aggregated the nationally determined contributions, in fact, put us on a pathway to a warming scenario of between 2.7 and 3.6 degrees. That is, if we add together all of the commitments made by all of the countries, we were not likely to meet the objective of the Paris Agreement. And therefore, the concern of the um, uh, of, of the meetings of the Paris to agreement of the parties to the agreement you have now become how do we increase the ambition in other words how do we increase the level of commitment that is being made by all of the different countries to meet uh, the uh, 1.5 degrees target and in order to do that each country has to revise its nationally determined commitments upwards, increase the amount of greenhouse gas that is going to be, and also increase the amount of contributions to adaptation actions and so on. Now, the, 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 this challenge is based on the key difference between the Paris Agreement and the Kyoto Protocol, where the Kyoto Protocol actually allocated emissions targets to various countries based on the principle of common but differentiated abilities and national circumstances. So in terms of that differentiation, the Kyoto Protocol allocated specific mitigation targets to developed countries. Each developed country was informed at the beginning of every year of the protocol, how much carbon they were allowed to emit. Uh, and beyond that carbon, there were penalties that were put in place to ensure that in fact, the country could stay within the limits but there were also alternative measures, such as, for instance, possibilities for carbon trading, which would make it possible for emitting countries to trade the excess carbon that they were emitting with non-emitting countries in order to support development actions in those non-emitting countries, but also in order to support actions that were aimed at absorbing the excess carbon dioxide in developing countries. Now, this creates a separate set of challenges, but it certainly did, in fact, uh, commit responsibilities to developing and developed uh, countries. The Paris Agreement uh, does not do this, and hence the Paris Agreement faces the perennial challenge of whether, in fact, uh, the nationally determined contributions can uh, be ramped up in a way that would enable the achievement of the 1.5 degrees goal without at the same time a legal or political framework which is capable of compelling uh, those um, uh, actions at the uh, national uh, level. Now my final slide and then we can sort of have a general discussion. Uh, here is, is basically to just add a little bit more uh, uh, detail on the issue of common but differentiated abilities. We can bring this to uh, COP27, uh, the recently concluded COP where uh, Africa, uh, one of the principal demands of the African group of negotiators was the need for Africa's special conditions and circumstances to be recognized by the COP. COP process. In other words, Africa was negotiating for common but differentiated abilities to be brought back as a core principle of the Paris Agreement. And by so doing, to actually compel industrialized nations to invest more in climate actions, um, while developing nations would be allowed uh, to uh, we would continue to invest in climate actions, but would be allowed a different set of actions. Uh, this is now contextualized as the just transition 
uh, debate where developing nations feel that they need, for instance, to be allowed a grace period to pick their carbon dioxide emissions, that is, to use uh, whatever resources, energy and other resources they have, regardless of the contemporary impact of that use of resources on greenhouse gas emissions. But to use that increase in greenhouse gas emissions to invest in technologies, in energies that would allow for a rapid transition to uh, zero emissions at a period later than developed uh, nations. Uh, and so this, this, this very broad is the just sort of a transition uh, 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 debate. Uh, but what is, what, 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 what is really holding back the agreement on the just transitions is this different rate of development between advanced nations and particularly emerging uh, nations. And this has been key, particularly since the 2008 uh, financial uh, crisis, uh, where nations have been at various stages uh, of emerging from the crisis. And then we are faced with the COVID crisis. Emerging from that crisis, we are now faced uh, with the Ukraine-Russia uh, war. And all of these crises, remember, the imperative is to have a green or a so-called uh, green transition out of those. But the unspoken rivalry between the developing, the emerging nations and the developed nations is that at every stage, the emerging nations uh, appear to uh, have the possibility of growing their economies faster than the advanced nations. And therefore the developed nations are not willing to see the climate, the climate uh, uh, agreement as part of a governance regime, which is going to constrain the ability of their economies to recover from the financial crisis, from COVID, uh, from the war, and so on. And so we are continuing to have this contestation between national economies, the Westphalian state, and the global governance regime, where at every stage, the global regime is trumped by uh, the, um, the, 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 the principal sort of concerns of the uh, nation uh, state. The solution that has been offered uh, now is uh, in polycentric uh, governance, uh, but uh, we can discuss uh, what that is. I think everyone working on the commons understands uh, the solutions that have been put forward by Lynn Ostrom and others working on uh, polycentric polycentricity and how you can bring together the different levels of authority and different levels of governance to ensure that the global mechanism becomes effective at all uh, levels. But allow me to stop there and we can have a general sort of discussion about the extent to which polycentricity could effectively uh, bridge that gap between the nation state and the global uh, regime. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Mrombezi. Uh, that, that was uh, an uh, excellent presentation. I think taking us uh, from Kyoto, Paris, and even linking us uh, with uh, Shamal Sheikh uh, towards the end. So these were very good um, insights. So what I would do is maybe to ask for questions and comments from uh, uh, participants before we come in with any other further comments. I'm, I'm taking note of time that we, we do we have limited time, so we need to get uh, the comments and questions as soon as possible. Uh, participants, uh, anyone uh, who wants to, to speak, uh, you could... Uh... Just a reminder, there's a Q&A function at the... Okay, we have a yes. question now. I, I see, I, I think uh, we have a question from Jesse Ribo. He says, uh, we common students all know that uh, polycentricity is, but it lacks any notion of power. In Lin's framing, can you elaborate on what you mean by it in this context? Do yeah, Jesse. To... Okay, go ahead. Hi, Jesse. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, comment. Uh, I agree. I, th I think the real challenge in the, the, I think this has been the point of our paper as well, to say that there is an enormous imbalance uh, of power between nations in the global climate governance regime. And it is in fact that power, and you, you can also trace that uh, imbalance in, for instance, the ability of nations to meet sustainable development goals and so on. So all of these global frameworks that are put uh, in place are already weak 
by the extent to which they cannot in fact distribute power uh, equally between uh, nations. So what we mean by police, police centricity as a potential solution here is, firstly, if we can actually get the global climate governance regime to create legally binding mechanisms. Uh, let's put aside the uh, fact, the, the, the question of how a mechanism can be legally binding at the global level. That's another problematic. But if we can put in place mechanisms which compel nations to act in certain ways at the national level, and then also compel nations to decentralize those actions. Because we know that climate actions, in fact, okay, mostly at the local level in response to national policies. So one, the legal mechanism. But the second way of equalizing the imbalance in power is to ensure that there are adequate financial flows uh, to support climate actions at all levels. Again, what this means in terms of policy centricity is we have created the different mechanisms, uh, different um, um, uh, institutions uh, to uh, collect and distribute finance for climate uh, actions. But this has never, have never been adequately uh, resourced. And these have also never adequately developed mechanisms to distribute uh, resources equitably among nations. Again, that needs to be resolved as part of policy centricity. And of course, we have to distribute costs and benefits uh, equitably as well. So this is in general what uh, I see as uh, policy centricity in uh, the framing. But I agree with you that uh, uh, the, 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 the framing does not uh, address the uh, power uh, relations issues adequately. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mrombedzi. I, I, I think, uh, Jesse, uh, let me know if uh, that is fine or you need uh, a follow-up question on that. In the meantime, we are moving on to our next question. Uh, and then it says, can Dr. Mrombedzi please then zero in on implications for African states and where that leaves them as African Union and as, its, as sovereign states? Yeah. Um... So the, the implications uh, for African states, well, I think the, the implications for the, uh, and for, for the global atmosphere is that we in fact need to anticipate that we might continue uh, to get, uh, um, to, 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 to approximate situations where we might interfere with the global climate system irreversibly unless we put in place a regime that is capable of regulating the actions of our states. Today, in this age, African states are actually faced with the triple, with the, with, with the dual problem of responding to the impacts of already occurring uh, climate change, as well as developing their economies. Now, the impacts of climate change, in fact, have the effect of constraining development potential to the extent, for instance, that uh, nations have limited energy uh, possibilities. I uh, have to respond to, uh, for instance, changes in weather uh, rainfall patterns. I uh, have to respond to changes in uh, in the distribution of uh, resources uh, for different activities as a result of the increasing ex expenditures uh, to um, to address impacts of climate change, right? One of the big debates at Sham or Sheikh was the whole question of loss and damage. Loss and damage being how do you compensate for irretrievable uh, losses, such as for instance, lost economic uh, opportunities. Uh, and so where it leaves the African states is a situation where states, the states have made it clear that everyone else has to decarbonize their economies while Africa has to industrialize. In other words, for Africa to be able to address the impacts of already occurring climate change, the continent has to develop its economies. And to do that, they have to industrialize. But if Africa industrializes while everyone else continues to emit at current levels, then of course that is not going to be sustainable. There is so much space left in the glo global atmosphere to absorb any additional emissions. And therefore, Africa needs to find mechanisms to compel the rest of the world to decarbonize and decarbonize at a pace that has already been identified by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But also Africa has to be able to negotiate the use of that atmospheric space which is left uh, or which is still available uh, to support uh, life as we know it on the planet. This is how I see it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Mrombezi. Maybe just as a follow-up to the comment that you uh, you have just mentioned that uh, Africa has to compel uh, uh, the international community. Maybe looking at the 
overall global international institutional architecture, uh, which sometimes is a reflection of the different power dynamics. What sort of mechanisms could uh, Africa have to compare to actually ensure that they compare the, the other countries who might be more powerful uh, in different respects to and, and um, especially, we want also to get your insights as being part of the negotiations. What are some of the mechanisms or uh, the leverages that uh, developing countries in Africa have used in order to sort of, uh, uh, as maybe use weapons, I don't know whether we could uh, say weapons of the week in terms of deriving some of what they want uh, from those who are more powerful. Over to you. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> I anticipated that uh, question. So, if, if, if uh, look, look, looking firstly at uh, the structure uh, of uh, industrial processes now uh, and the rate at which uh, the transition to uh, green, uh, renewable, uh, energy-based processes is happening, you will notice uh, that, in fact, uh, and, and, and the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, I think, makes it quite clear. There, isn't, there hasn't been adequate investment in green technologies uh, on which to base uh, industrial processes. And there's still massive dependence on uh, fossil uh, fuels. Uh, a significant uh, proportion of uh, fossil fuels actually is uh, still uh, being discovered uh, in Africa. And so Africa could leverage the potential exploitation and utilization of those fossil fuels in ways that could actually put the world on a path to net zero. That is one. But the second, and also minerals based, is the fact that a lot of a significant amount of the uh, green battery minerals are actually located on the continent. Uh, so the exploitation of those minerals is going to be energy intensive, is going to uh, be emissions intensive, as mining is, until you find ways of abating uh, mineral uh, or mining based emissions. I think we have to accept that mining is going to continue to be problematic. However, the products uh, of, that my, of those mining activities it is the lithium, cobalt, um, uh, even green hydrogen. Africa has certain comparative advantages in terms of the location of those resources on the continent. And this could be used uh, to uh, at least leverage some development potential for the continent. That cannot happen until you change the ways in which African economies are articulated into the global economy, right? In other words, that cannot happen until Africa develops its potential to add value to those minerals, stop exporting raw materials, begins processing those raw materials, begins industrializing on the basis of those materials and so on. And for that to happen, I think Africa has the institutional mechanism, which is the Africa continental free trade area. Uh, if the free trade area can in fact uh, be operationalized in ways that would actually promote intra-African trade, uh, but that would also be based on movements of capital within the African continent itself. One of the biggest challenges the continent faces is uh, the whole uh, question of debt. Uh, the continent borrows at very high levels, while everyone else borrows at uh, very low levels. And so there are many processes that are being put in place to ensure that, in fact, for instance, we can, uh, or the continent uh, can uh, use its natural resources in order to leverage uh, debt that is reasonably uh, expensive. So, for instance, if everyone else is borrowing at 3% and Africa is borrowing at 11 percent. Can we put in place a debt regime where we borrow at 3 percent like everyone else? And also, can we renegotiate the legacy debt and so on? So there are many initiatives that are being put in place at the level of the Africa Union, which actually seek to put in place a regime which would ensure that, in fact, the continent can uh, uh, leverage its resources to support its development. Uh, the success of those, again, uh, I think, the unspoken part of uh, Jesse's question was, <laughs> if you have these power imbalances, can you actually compel a change in the global financial architecture without something else happening? Well, I don't think we can, but uh, let's see what happens. Thank you. So Thank you Charlie. very much. Thank you very much. Uh, what we could do, uh, since we started a bit late, uh, we, if you indulge us, uh, the participants uh, and Dr. Mrombezi, just to allow us to go a few minutes over the limit. Uh, so what uh, I would propose is that uh, I would take the two questions that uh, I have outstanding, and Charlie will also have um, uh, a question after that. 
and then before we conclude and hand over to Charlie for so maybe if you indulge us we'll try to uh, go beyond uh, our scheduled time since we started a bit late in order to accommodate uh, some of the questions which have already been put. The next question uh, for you Dr Mrombeds comes from Nene Mugambi and uh, the, he says African countries such as Kenya are at the forefront of contributing to global climate mitigation goals through renewable energy production such as wind power of which is displacing rural arid, arid communities that are already vulnerable to climate change. Should rural arid livelihoods that are climate vulnerable be sacrificed by states to achieve the greater goal of global climate mitigation? That's the first one. I don't know if you want, to, I could read the second one so that you take them at the same time as well. The second one is from Papa Fai. Uh, Papa Fai uh, asks, to what extent do you think the rise of populism in developed countries, which pushes for economic development at national level, can limit the commitments of those countries with regards to the climate change agenda or financing? So those are the two questions for you are from Munene and from Papa Fai. Uh, over to you, Dr. Mrombeds. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Yes, uh, Nene, I think uh, this is a very key uh, consideration. Um, and it's, it's also a consideration that is uh, being negotiated as part of the uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, the impacts uh, of the climate response measures uh, many uh, and could actually be uh, very serious. Uh, and they include uh, what you have mentioned, for instance, what happens, uh, uh, to what extent do climate actions displace local communities, to what extent uh, local rights uh, and benefits uh, destabilized by climate actions and so on. And in fact, part of uh, the, I think it's Article 7 of the Paris Agreement is focused specifically on response measures, understanding what climate response measures could do to local economies, could do to local economy, to, to local communities, institutions, and so on, and how those impacts can be managed uh, and uh, regulated. This is an ongoing conversation, and I think it is important that particularly in Africa, we carry out a sufficient research and put in place data to demonstrate the actual impact of those response measures in order to contribute to a global uh, mechanism which addresses uh, one of the biggest challenges we face we face is the absence or the paucity of data to support the positions of the african group of negotiators but if we can have this kind of data and we put it through the negotiations then i think it can actually be uh, one of the achievements of uh, africa's contributions to uh, the, the global negotiations Papa Fai, yeah. <laughs> now, this is a question I think I, I, I have not really thought about uh, the implications of uh, the rise of uh, populism for uh, climate action. But you could be right uh, in the sense that uh, national governments will be constrained to respond to the demands of their own uh, electorates uh, in uh, different ways, right? I recall a few years ago um, in, uh, in, in France, there was an attempt to uh, regulate uh, the uh, to to put in to to remove fossil fuel subsidies and to regulate the cost of fossil fuels, uh, which resulted which which uh, stimulated the growth of the was it the was it the green vest the yellow vest yes the yellow uh, vest the the yellow vest uh, movement so here is a, a movement which normally would have been a very a, a force for positive development but which is actually responding to a positive a potentially positive uh, climate action in very negative ways right so the yellow vest are contesting uh, a national agreement because of the co i mean a national policy decision because of the potential cost of that decision on the livelihoods of uh, particularly uh, the lower and middle class uh, uh, households and so yes you are right i think uh, we, we cannot predict how the different climate actions are going to, or how political actions at the national and local levels are going to uh, react, respond, be stimulated by uh, climate actions. But I think that this is, this is a very important consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we move on to Charlie. Charlie, you have a question, please go ahead. Yes, hi, uh, well, we're, I'm hesitant to ask it, but I think I will. Um, just thank you so much for the talk. Thank you so much for your work on this so important issue. 
Um, in IESC, we have a subgroup that we call the Knowledge Commons group that studies digital knowledge commons. And another area is called common space peer production, where uh, we are using the internet to share um, intellectual property, um, uh, innovations, and so on. And I know there are many, many places that don't have access to the internet, so this isn't a solution. But um, one of the areas that some of the Knowledge Commons people are talking about is uh, the idea of um, scaling wide. Um, so this is getting at polycentricity in a way, the, that innovations that are being done at a local level are shared with the world. Um, sometimes the phrase is called design global, manufacture local. And I guess I'm just wondering, you know, you're, you've been talking at the very, very important area of global um, collective action and national efforts. And, um, but I'm wondering, you know, in, in your experience at COP27 or in any of your other travels, if you're hearing these types of ideas where local communities are sharing climate change uh, resilience innovations or um, things across the globe um, using the internet as a platform. Is that something that's being talked about? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Charlie, for that. Um, so to begin with the, the organization that I work for, uh, every year convene what is called the Climate Change and Development in Africa uh, Conference, uh, which is really an attempt to bring together the different aspects, I mean, uh, African perspectives on uh, the intersections between, the different intersections between climate change and development, and use that to inform the positions of the Africa group of negotiators. But as part of uh, the, uh, this uh, conference, there is a component which is called the Solutions Forum. And this is an open forum where uh, different stakeholders, <laughs> to use the term, uh, bring forward things that they are trying to do or things that they are implementing, which they are finding to be effective. So you could have, for instance, local governments coming to talk about how they are putting in place uh, local tax regimes, uh, which are directing development uh, activities or other normal activities within their constituencies in a way that is climate friendly. And the, the, the ways in which they would like the global uh, climate funds to respond by providing uh, resources for those actions and so on. So you have a multiplicity of solutions that are being offered. And in the last uh, CCDA, we actually began uh, to discuss the whole question of how we could deploy digital digital technologies in order to strengthen the different climate responses and climate solutions that uh, are being uh, brought forward. So yes, we also acknowledge that uh, the digital uh, resources are not equally available to all the different uh, uh, constituencies, but we are also aware that there is a lot that is being done now uh, in order to develop uh, digital solutions. And in fact, the youth participants in these conferences, their preferences are all in fact towards digital solutions. Uh, and many of them, in fact, have the capacities to utilize digital solutions towards addressing our climate impacts. So this is something that we could discuss uh, with the uh, ISC uh, and uh, look at uh, whether, in fact, we could integrate uh, the knowledge that we have developed within the ISC with the uh, CCDA Solutions uh, Forum, and perhaps even have ISC participants physically uh, in that Solutions Forum to also help further guide potential uh, or possible um, uh, collaborations going forward. Thank you. Uh I know, I know I can speak for some of the community who would welcome that. And again, thank you so much for your, your efforts and your colleagues' efforts on this important issue. Um, at this point, I'm just gonna share screen. Thank you for the attendees for um, staying on a little long. Um, I, hopefully you can see uh, the screen, my screen. I'm going to uh, adjust things a little bit. Um, I just as we close, I wanted to let the participants know about other um, World Commons Week events that are happening. This is our, uh, this was a great start to our week of webinars. 
Uh, right now, uh, we launched a Teaching the Commons video contest, um, and on the, the website, um, there are the finalists for voting for uh, available. Um, let, let me just quickly go through what's coming up. So in about 12 hours from now, we're going to have Aaron Matakari Akar um, in New Zealand um, talking about Maori legal systems in the commons. Just gonna do this very quickly. On December 7th, we're going to have Javier talk about local and global lessons of aquatic foods. Um, on uh, December 8th in Asia, Eduardo will be talking about the state of research on collective action in the commons. Our uh, China webinar will be uh, Yahua, who's going to be talking about a, a textbook. This one will be in Chinese. All the others will be in English, with the exception of uh, Latin America, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, Europe, uh, Giuseppe is going to be talking about emerging and necessary commons governance issues in the interaction with the state and the market. Uh, oh, and I don't have the Latin American one up. Oh, sorry, I've missed that. Um, we're I'm forgetting the date too, but you can look on the website. But Latin America, uh, we have uh, a talk there. Um, again, check the website webinars for the information. And we'll close on December 10th with uh, acknowledging our great um, younger scholar community, uh, the early IESC Early Career Network, who are going to be talking about their community. As I close, I just want to remind people uh, that we have the biennial IESC conference in Nairobi scheduled for June uh, 19th through the 24th. Uh, and we hope, I, I hope to meet some of you in person there. Uh, I want to thank my two co-organizers on the screen um, for the assistance. And to close, uh, again, you can find more in the event, World Commons Week in the top URL. Uh, the conference is in the, um, you can see that URL. And if you're not an ISC member and you liked what we were seeing here, we'd love you to become one. So there's the links um, there. With that, let me thank our speaker. It's hard to thank appropriately in this environment, but thank you. Um, and Everisto, thank you for uh, uh, organizing this uh, really excellent, excellent um, start to our webinar series. Thank you so much. And I wish you a great day for the rest of your uh, whatever, whatever time zone you're in. Thank, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Charlie. And uh, for participants who will also be sharing this, we are recording. This is, was an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Mrombezi, for your time. This has been very informative and we'll share it, uh, the recorded version uh, with more uh, potential listeners. Thank you very much. That's right. They'll be, it'll be up on the web website. Thank you. Have a Thank good day, everyone. Thank you very everyone. much. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay. I'm going to turn off recording.